I signed up for the New York City Marathon because it was the first big race I was able to qualify for and I was just so excited. From what I've heard, it's the Super Bowl of running. There's no other race in the world where there's that kind of energy. If I were to put out a time that I want to hit at the New York City Marathon, it would be 2.50. I think I can do that. I think it has to be a really good day. I'm not going to blow up halfway trying to hang on to a 2.50, but I am really going to fight for somewhere between that 2.50, 2.54 if going sub 2.50 isn't possible. I think the beginning of a marathon build is really fun. You're not running a lot of kilometers or miles, so it's easier on your body. But I'm really excited to get things started and, and get this whole thing going. My name is Michael Sui. I'm 24 years old and I currently live in Vancouver, Canada, but I was born and raised in Calgary. I mean, I always played sports growing up. I ran when I played soccer and then I played a lot of badminton growing up too, but I never really considered myself a runner. I started running a little more seriously or evolving from that when I was in university here. I came here to go to school at UBC Sauter to study finance. I lived basically on UBC campus beside Pacific Spirit Park, which is this, like, this huge natural park, and I started exploring in there. So I started going for runs to there, running a little bit farther, running to escape from, you know, all the stress of university. The first race I ever ran was a half marathon and I ran that at UBC as well. So that was the Fall Classic. When I crossed that finish line, it was a feeling that I hadn't really experienced before. Like, just so proud of myself, um, so pumped that I had done that. I remember being in a lot of pain too, but I definitely wanted to come back and I thought, okay, if I can do that, then eventually I can go a little farther than that. I had dreamed of doing a marathon one day, probably all the way back to when I was 13 or 14 years old. I think that first came up when I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes around that time. And I think I, you know, not even really knowing it, I built a little bit of a chip on my shoulder and doing a marathon was like the hardest physical thing I thought I could do. And I was like, hey, you know, just because I have diabetes doesn't mean I can't do, you know, whatever that is. And for me, it was the marathon. <laughs> Take a little blood sugar refuel here. Definitely can feel it dropping a bit, so I'm gonna crack open a little rocket and pick up my Take about like five minutes for the rocket to hit. So I'll bring my blood sugar back up, probably one more before I jog home after. And then we'll be all good. Today was doing a little laps around here, We're going from Kits down to Jericho here, all the way down to Spanish Banks. The sky is looking nice that way. Um, just moved down to the area here, even closer here. So probably out here like three or four times a week, and this is where all the easy runs happen for New York. So this is my my favorite spot here, and we'll probably be out here a couple more times. I ran my first marathon in 2012. I ran my first marathon eight years ago. I have run two marathons. So the first was CIM, California International Marathon, and I ran the Vancouver Marathon in May. I ran Victoria Marathon, and it was really good. I didn't, I just went into it 
thinking, I just don't want to get hurt. And it was supposed to be the BMO Vancouver Marathon, but unfortunately I got injured leading up to it. Um, but I had set the goal that I wanted to run a marathon no matter what that year. So at the end of the year, I signed up for the Boundary Bay Marathon. 2019, it was the Stockholm Marathon, and I was there doing my semester abroad. Just thought it would be like a super cool thing to do. Didn't really train for it at all, but showed up on race day, had a, you know, a great time for at least the first 25 kilometers. Just everything completely fell apart. I, I guess I hit the wall, I just hit it really early. Part of that, as I discovered later, is because my, my blood sugar was super high, so I hadn't learned how to manage that properly yet. And the second part was probably just because I didn't train properly, but I remember being out there, cramping, just struggling, getting passed by a ton of people. No, 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 no. I'll never forget, you come up this road, and then you can see the Olympic Stadium, and you get to run one lap. Attaboy. And I knew that's where the finish was, and I was hyperventilating, and I was Woo. so excited. I just ran like as fast as I could. Attaboy, Michael! I was crying, and I was like, sweating, and it was everything. It was so cool. Probably still like the coolest thing I think I've done. At that point, I don't think I was hooked at all. I don't think I was like, I'm gonna come back and run tons of marathons. Like, I wanna train for this properly and do this, but I think I did have something in the back of my head that said, okay, if I can do a 324 marathon and, and struggle through it, what if I actually train? Do I think I could get to a three hour marathon one day? Do you, I think I could qualify for the Boston Marathon? And I don't think I had an answer to that, but that was probably the first time that I was really asking that question to myself in my head. I'm Ali. I am a medical student at UBC. My involvement with running is through a club, uh, Mile to Marathon. My name is Carla Parsons. I'm one of the coaches with Mile to Marathon. My name is Stephanie McGregor, and I'm a run coach with Mile to Marathon. I love the coaching job. It's the best thing. I think every finish line is that moment of feeling just so proud of yourself for getting to the finish line because that race should be that celebration of all the hard work you've done to get there. When I'm talking to athletes and I see maybe that they're really analyzing something every little second, it's interesting to see that from the coaches part of it. Um, they're out there trying, they're giving it their all and that's really all we can ask for so I try to remind myself of that when I'm going into a race or into a workout. And always that feeling of I'm never doing this again <laughs> and then I do it again. <laughs> I had no clue what mile marathon was. I had no clue that there is like run groups or run teams or run clubs. So it was actually during the pandemic. I was kind of going through a time where I needed to find something new. You know, I wasn't going to the gym. I wasn't doing other stuff. I was running on my own. My favorite kid, why don't I, you know, look into this, give it a try. So I signed up for mile the marathon because my friend had recommended it to me and it was also closest to where I lived. So it just, made the most sense for me. And that's sort of how I got my introduction to run clubs in general and mile marathon. So the way I train and the way most people at mile to marathon train is that there's two workouts a week where we all come together. Wednesdays is a day on the track, two and a half, three K warm up and then we'll do some drills and strides, sort of like high knees and butt kicks things, A's and B's, and just some things to get your legs snapping and moving. Strides is just basically a fancy word for like a controlled sprint or just getting your legs moving faster so that when you start speeding up during the workout, you're not, it's not a huge shock to the system. We usually take a group photo, <laughs> and so we have a group photo from every workout. In lieu of not having a group on Saturday, we're gonna do a social group long run on Sunday if you wanna join us, all right? We're gonna meet at Olympic Village Sparrows for an 8.15. We'll go around the seawall, end up at Stanley Park. I'll have my car so you can just 
dash gear. And we split out into little groups that we run with. Alright, here we go. Go around the track, everybody does their workout. You do like a 400 meter, 800 meter, 1200 meter, 1600. And then, you know, you come back down and do 1200, 800, 400, and you have 60 seconds rest in between each of those. So more focused on speed or intervals or just a faster pace for yourself. Different speeds, switching gear sort of thing. Some people do a couple more reps or sets than others, but usually that takes like 45 minutes, and then yeah, usually wrap up and and head out. Feel good. Everything's intact, so we're done. One kilometer repeats. 400s are a little a little short these days, so we're trying to do it longer. All right, sir. I'm gonna cool down. And then on Saturdays, it's more of a long run day. So long run can be totally different distance depending on who you're talking to or what part of their build they're in or what race they're even building for. And you'll be doing something like four kilometers at marathon pace and then one kilometer easy. And then, you know, four kilometers, one kilometer easy, plus like a warm up and cool down. So at the end of the day, like you'll still have these intervals, but the intervals will probably be longer, like smoother, I guess I would call them. Mild Marathon trains at Big Oz. It's basically this almost perfect five kilometer loop where there's not a lot of traffic. There's some really nice bike lanes and running paths broken down into five sort of distinct kilometers. They're all different. There's a gradual uphill. There's a gradual downhill. There's sort of a quicker downhill. And then there's a rolling section. And then there's also like a really steep hill right at like kilometer four to five transition right at the end of all of your reps and then sort of flat back into the finish. Here he comes, looking smooth. It's challenging, but it's also, at least for myself, I associate like my marathon build with, with that loop and, and looping it with the group early on Saturday mornings. Oh my God, making me work to get this shot. I know. <laughs> How you feeling? Okay. It's just like two and a half to go. It's all mental. You got it's all it. Mental now. You have to maybe, maybe sort of day. dig maybe deep and learn something day. about yourself. It's not just going out there and running as fast as you can. It's a lot of a mental game as well. So it's a long journey that you're going on. But when you have that crew, when I'm feeling good, I pull you. When you're feeling good, you pull me and you sort of start to build this momentum as like a team. I was like, wow, I'm making a lot of progress. I'm getting a lot faster here. And that was super exciting. I think that's super exciting for anybody. I signed up with a coach who is still my coach to this day, Kevin Coffey, because he was really fast. <laughs> I thought it was really cool to be coached by somebody who's really fast. Kevin provides personalized workouts, feedback on how things are going, and we work on the training plan together. So I think having a coach or coaches around you and people who can share that experience and that knowledge is, is really big. You can go out there and run yourself, and you can, and you can do great things that way. But I think like anything, it's really nice to have that person alongside you for, for the journey. Here at the uh, East Side 10K, here to cheer on my girlfriend. Big day, beautiful weather, 12 degrees. Get some shots for today and uh, cheer her on. She's feeling pretty good. Yesterday, not so confident. Today, she's, she's pretty dialed in, so I think she's gonna be quick. Starting at like four, sub four, and she's gonna crank it down all the way maybe to 340. We'll see. Good work, good work! Are you okay? 
Pretty happy I didn't do that one. It's just very tough on those hills, which probably would have been good for my training, but um, early in the morning that day, I, I wasn't really feeling that, but it was super cool to watch her race that 10K as well. It's a super fun event, that one. Really great energy. start to join a running community or get more involved with it or get more interested in the sport, you almost can't help but spectate other races or track your friends and all these other races as if you would like a pro sports team or following like your favorite hockey team or, or basketball team. You kind of get nervous for them because you know, like you know they're hurting, you know what that feels like. And then when they reach the end, whether they hit their goal or not, or you know, in some people's cases they like finally get under that, that three hour mark that they've been trying for 10 years. You're so happy for them because you've gotten that glimpse into what they put into that, like the effort, the struggle, um, the desire they have for that. And it's just so easily relatable that I think you can't help but be like attracted to it and energized by it. And, and you know, just so personally connected and like happy for them that they were able to do that. One of the things that makes the marathon such a challenge is the time frame you're out there is so long. There's a lot to prepare for in terms of your fueling and stuff, so that's always a, a bit of a concern. You know, how is my stomach gonna react to the food I'm putting in? The second thing that I'm always aware of, my diabetes. You can eat the same thing every day, you can follow the exact same routine, and it's going to show you completely different responses to what's going on. No matter how much I prepare or how much routine I have for it, on that day, things could all be different. That's something that, that's always in the back of my mind there that I always trying to control, but could affect my race, and that's just something I'm gonna have to deal with while I'm out there and respond to while I'm out there. So basically, a really high level what dealing with diabetes is the pancreas organ isn't really working anymore. Um, so when that shuts down, your body doesn't produce insulin. And what the insulin is doing is just letting your body absorb all of the, the sugar and carbohydrate from the food you eat. So because my body doesn't produce insulin, what I use is like some, some medical insulin. So what I have is an orange one, which is called my rapid insulin. And this is what I use every time I eat or when my blood sugar goes a little bit too high. And this can go into your stomach, your butt, your quads, your arms. Um, each person's different and it's based on, you know, the amount of sugar you're eating, how your body reacts to it, plus what your blood sugar level is. So to test my blood sugar, which I'm sure a lot of people have seen, there's these little kits that you can use. Take a little strip put it in this little glucose monitor, choose a finger, poke it with a little needle, and then you'll draw just a little bit of blood, and then it'll give you a number. 76, so for most people, that equates like a five. So that's really good because a normal person without diabetes is gonna be between sort of a four and a seven. What I use and what really helps me when I run is I have uh, this thing inserted here, and this does the same thing, you just don't have to poke your fingers and, and draw blood. So it's sort of just locked in there. And then I use an app on my phone and I actually just scan over it and it'll give me a reading. So you can see, as I said, it's about a five and it'll chart that continuous um, measurement. So this is something that's super helpful. You can see how you're at during your runs and how it went through your runs. And that's how I keep track of my blood sugar most of the time now. Driving my blood sugar super high I get really fatigued. I get like cloudy mentally. I sweat a lot. My body doesn't perform very well. What's even worse is if my blood sugar goes low during the marathon because going low, you know, can put me out for 15, 20 minutes, cause me to eat a lot of food. I become 
very, very weak, very hungry, can become dizzy. There's a lot of variables that go into it, but I think it's just a lot of practicing, being aware and trying to, you know, keep improving every run, learning what works best for me. I always carry with me like extra sugar when I run and during the day, usually with Rockets candy. It's like the fastest acting sugar you can buy. It acts just as fast as if you're hammering like raw sugar. You know, diabetes takes some work and you know, there's up days and down days and there's annoying parts about it. But over time, I think, you know, it, you're just like anybody else. You have your things that you deal with and once you deal with them, you, you know, you can, you can do the same thing. You can do more things. You can use it as an inspiration. Uh, when I tell people I run marathons, they usually laugh and tell me I'm crazy. <laughs> I think they're really impressed. Um, maybe they don't always understand the difference in the distances. Um, but I love the reaction I get when I tell people I'm a runner and how passionate I am. Whether I'm saying I'm running a marathon in 10 hours or in 2 hours. For a lot of people they have no idea what the difference is and I think they just find it really impressive so that's pretty cool. One response is like, oh wow, like that's crazy. I could never do that. I feel like that's something people say a lot like, oh I could never run a marathon. Like, I can't even run 10k. I truly think that Anyone can do this sport, it doesn't matter what your background is, how fast you are, how often you run, like if it's something that you're drawn to, then listen to that and just follow it. You may think that you have to run a marathon to be a runner, you don't. You can run 1K to be a runner and you don't ever have to do a marathon. It's so much time out of your life and so much time out there training that you have to be ready to do that distance to sign up and be able to commit. Just take it each step at a time. It's really overwhelming if you think, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna run a marathon. Just start one day at a time, one little distance at a time, one run at a time. And then eventually if you find that that like urge is striking you to go the 42.2, then that's when you sign up. I went online in the middle of the day, found this beautiful tweet from the Boston Athletic Association saying that all qualified athletes will be accepted as long as you have a legit time, which hopefully we all do. So yeah, it was really quick. We found out about Boston. I was super pumped. Just read the tweet from the Boston Athletic Association and it looks like there's no cut for this year. So we're all going to Boston, the whole squad, me, Ali, Dong. Tom, everybody, we're all going, we made it, woo! Honestly, pretty emotional. I think just really exciting, really proud of myself for that coming to life. Boston is that thing that I never thought I could achieve or would take a lot longer to achieve. And now it seems like it's actually a reality. After qualifying for Boston at CIM, I was still kind of on the fence about it. I was pretty tired at that point. Michael Sui personally had actually told myself like once I do that I would be pretty comfortable with walking away and trying something new like maybe learning how to do something on the bike or or anything in, in life I wasn't set on running but the consistency the the social groups and that feeling of like pride and accomplishment that I get from running that's what gets me coming back something that also motivated me was my girlfriend she also qualified for Boston at CIM and she had so many goals beyond that goals to you know run faster to run the major marathons to you know reach an Olympic qualifying standard one day and try and do those just huge goals why do I need to stop now uh, maybe there's other things here for me and pacing travel um, trying new distances that you know, I think I'll be stuck in the sport for, for a long time. <laughs> Doing some spicy bibimbap rice bowls. We got some sesame seeds, some swaz, some rice, some Beyond Meat, which they didn't tell me was Beyond Meat. And then some, uh, some smoky vegetables going down in here. Voila, there she is. It's a little small, but it's a full meal for sure. So get us through this Saturday, fueled up for tomorrow. I just stopped the continuous reps here to get a little fuel in and Try and bring the blood sugar back up. 
not ideal, but definitely worth, worth it here in the workout to uh, not completely crash and, and stay alive. So a couple minutes, not a big deal. First hill specific workout, doing eight times, 80 seconds up, jogging back down. This absolute cutie out of hell. So we're rolling continuous reps here, which is really gonna put a strain on that turkey pad thai I ate an hour ago. Four reps in, taking a little hit from our favorite performance drink, H2O. Finish, legs feel a little fresher than I did when I started, to be honest. So it's a, it's a win, food stayed down, almost went a little too far down, but uh, we're back home now, so we good. Here we go. Oh, very nice. Fired up, they're feeling good. Workout done, we uh, absolutely emptied the tank. Those on and off kilometers at the end really just ruined me. Lil folding bucket. Uh, this build has way more long runs, like probably like eight or nine runs close to 30 kilometers. Whereas in my whole life, I've probably done eight or nine runs up to 30 kilometers. It's definitely taking a toll on just my overall energy. Like it takes a couple days after for me to recover and then I'm good for a day or two. But after like a workout on Wednesday on the track or something like that, it, it definitely starts to fade again. And I just haven't been feeling a hundred percent myself. So. so tired, so fatigued. Um, didn't even really want to eat, like my body just felt really off. I even went to the doctor just to get it checked out, make sure all my vitamins and stuff are normal, and they are, uh, which is good to go, but I've definitely been feeling tired, so I think um, instead of cranking up the mileage, I'm going to keep it pretty flat and even take a couple extra rest days here because at this point, I felt like it's gone really well and I don't want to, you know, totally break down, hurt myself, or just get really tired and sort of lose the excitement here. So ready to grind, but also trying to be smart here and trying to stay healthy, like physically and also in the right space mentally. That was a tough week for me, just because I knew like I was burning out 10 weeks into training when I still have six more weeks to go. I needed to talk to myself and be like, okay, hey, like how do I feel is running today going to be productive no like take care of your body first there's a long way to go welcome to the humble abode um, I started out with these bad boys and some old uh, tempos and uh, they are very well used have about 2,000 kilometers on them a full nine months or so um, they got pretty beat up. Keeping these around, but they're retired from the running for now. Um, to replace them, we have the exact same pair, but in a even cooler color. I think it's actually a woman's shoe, but I got some pretty small feet, so I get to choose from men and women. So that's great. Using these ones for all of my uh, quicker and longer runs right now. For my easy days right now, I'm rocking the new Pegasus they made here. Um, with like the recycled foam and all that so you can see it's a little different looking there Honestly, can't really tell much of a difference when I'm rolling with them, but they're really comfy on race day my Alpha flies or Alpha fly next percent the OGs uh, bought these bad boys when they first got released like one of the very first versions of them during the pandemic So I never got to use them um, until my marathon last year, but these bad boys cost me like way too much money off of the secondhand market to snag a pair. So thought about changing a little bit, but these things work for me. They're still really bouncy. And once again, they feel good on my feet, which is like the most important thing for me. So that's what we'll be rolling with for, for New York City. And they might get retired after that. Decent rest, just ate my Cheerios, stuffed them down, ready to go. It's been a long time to be out there. I always get a little nervous, I think, before 
wanna probably try like the uh what's it called? The, what's the nipple chafing stuff? <laughs> like body glide? Yeah, I might wanna try that. I'm nervous. I'm like nervous about my hip. Yeah. You can I think you can definitely do it. It should that's definitely just a big I should probably you know. Yeah. But if that I mean I can I don't know. So, thank you for coming. I'm glad everyone found the spot. I'm sure we got a couple of people at the ranger station right now being like, what? Uh, and that's their problem. Um, and the workout today is just cruise 5Ks for a lot of people. 5K out, jog around for four minutes or a kilometer, five minutes, six minutes, whatever you need, and then jam back. It's okay to finish the workout being like, I could have gone faster, I could have gone more. That shows you're fit and that shows that you're getting strong and it shows you're also controlling your pacing, which is so, so important in races. Everybody turn around and look at me! Up and turn, up and turn! Nice! Use your first rep to get your legs under you, feel your rhythm, it's a beautiful thing. Let's make sure we're sharing the path, uh, heads up, but let's get in a rhythm, let's take advantage of this weather, let's have a good workout, okay? a couple really big runs including a couple that were 36 37 kilometers and the goal of those was to try and sort of simulate New York City um, simulate the course a little bit and just simulate the feeling of going that far pushing the body that far I feel like I build a lot of confidence when I get closer to that 42.2 at least once just for the mental, for understanding that, you know, I'm not 10 kilometers away, I'm, I'm five kilometers away. It's not about going super fast, it's about trying to stay in that zone, trying to get my body comfortable with that zone, trying to stay relaxed in that, and just being able to spend time out there, physically and mentally, at that pace.
fail. Did she win any festive marathon than you at this point? Yeah, workout was on Stanley Park out here on the seawall. Probably the best place to do a workout like this. It's just 5k out and then 5k back, so almost perfectly flat along the water here. Uh, beautiful day, not that busy, so it's a really nice day for it and like really easy to to get out there and just float like mentally by the water there and just enjoy it. Uh, workout was like 5k warm up and then four sets of 5k at roughly marathon pace, uh, 1k float in between, 8k cool down out there. This was the longest one, the biggest one, so this was the peak. So I just wanted to feel good today and I did feel good today. So I'm really happy that we got through this one and feel really confident. Shoes felt good. Shirt felt good, a little, a little bit of chafing, possibly, after we talked about that. Uh, hamstrings and stuff are a bit tight, but we're gonna like work on that just to loosen them up. But it felt really fresh and I'm really happy with it. Something I've been doing lately, just trying to take a deeper dive into um, like everything to do with my running from like my blood sugar to like, my heart rate, my fueling, just trying to be like a proper marathon runner this time. This is from the UBC half marathon and I pulled up my 2019 versus my 2021 and something I've been looking at is my heart rate and um, just something that's really interesting between these things and some of my other half marathons is I've noticed that after about two and a half, two kilometers, my heart rate will spike up there and then it'll generally stay pretty flat. It kind of aligns with some of the stuff I've learned in school and just researching that uh, once your heart rate goes up, it's really hard to bring it back down. So that's something I'm trying to keep in mind with all my training right now, is that if I can take it easy for the first like two, three, four, five kilometers, keep my heart rate under control, then it's most likely gonna stay in control. So. Like that's just one of the cool insights I've found and just something that I think is going to make me feel more prepared and also hopefully actually be more prepared going into the actual race day. At the end too, I did spend a week in Calgary as well where I had another workout and it was sort of my last big workout. So what we're working with today is a 5K warm up. Probably gonna do that around the car and then come back. And then I'm gonna hit uh, 20k progression run. I'm trying to stay smooth today. Um, trying to stay positive. Legs have been pretty stiff the last week or so, but it's the last big one. Yesterday, tragedy struck in the form of my new tempo shoes. The AirPod has popped, but for today they will have to do. Hopefully they hold up and it doesn't feel too weird. This is the starting point for our last big run up in Calgary by the airport. Nice flat path. Not the most scenic running beside the road, but I think it'll do for today. Blood sugar's good to go, so got some gels. Just ate a cliff Bar to give it that steady carb hit throughout, but feeling good. Felt good going into it, but it started to heat up. I didn't, I didn't feel very good. I went through like 10 kilometers and I, I was just completely spent. Like I, I stopped at the turnaround point. I'm so tired. Um, I I just didn't have like anything in my body today. Uh, I was like cramping. My legs were giving out. I was breathing hard. Just like no energy. Um, like I felt like I'd run a marathon, and I was exhausted. I was tired. I was by myself. I had to run back because there's nobody else out there. Like I, I was also upset because I'm like standing at 10 kilometers into this, and like you know this is my my marathon pace for. For 42.2. I made it all the way back. I didn't stop. I don't think there was much progression to that run, but I'm, I'm really proud of myself for that one. Um, that's probably the biggest effort I've put in. That's what training's all about, and gotta trust that process. But uh, that is the tr majority of the training block is complete now, so we did it. It was a really great day for me mentally because I was able to push through what was probably the toughest day in my marathon build and it, it was probably the best simulation of what I'll go through at some point during the marathon. It hurts no matter how much training you've done. And at that point, 
you really have to rely on your mental fitness. It's kind of that point of unknown. There's so much more time out there on the road. There's so many more things that can happen. And I think that's really cool. I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. I think part of what makes running so intimidating is the fact that you have to go out in the cold and in the wet and the snow and the rain and be in front of everybody. Um, but when I moved to Vancouver, I lived in this neighborhood and it's just beautiful. It was warmer than Calgary and it just gave me an opportunity to go out and sort of do what everybody else was doing. And it really you know, made me want to get out the door and spend time outside. And now that I'm getting close to the end of the training here, to be honest, like, I'm kind of sick of running a little bit. I'm kind of tired of doing it every single day. I'm still not a super experienced runner, and my body still like, feels quite a bit of pain. I prefer to taper from like three weeks out and really reduce my running volume from probably like 75 down to like 50% down to about last week. I probably like 25%. I don't run a ton at all. We're right in the middle of UBC campus. Right over my shoulder here is the business building, UBC Solder. That's where I went to school for four and a half, five years of my life. Um, used to live right on the other end of campus. And I guess we'll take a little walkthrough of this next week because this is right near the finish line for the Great Trek Half Marathon. So we'll be out here next week uh, pacing the 135 group and cheering on Allie. I guess it's the first time you guys have had to keep yourself warm in a start line for a long time. I even had to bring a sweatshirt. The very first race I'd ever done is the first one I also paced, and I paced the 135 Great Trek Half Marathon. Great race out there, and we'll see you at the finish line and at the award stage. It was a little bit stressful for me as well because, you know, you know you can run those times, but when I got there, it's like there's a lot of people depending on me. Three, two, one. A 135 half marathon is four minutes and 30 seconds per kilometer. So every kilometer when I went past the sign, I was doing that math, making sure that I was like on schedule or just ahead of schedule. We got there on time, which was great. But I think the coolest thing about it and something that kind of put things in perspective for me is it's so much easier to run or to go through a lot of things in life when you don't make it about yourself. Things can seem like really difficult and like, oh, like I'm struggling right now, I'm going through this. And I think when you're running, because a lot of times it's just like you and the distance, 10 more kilometers to go, I have to do this, like I'm struggling. But when you're pacing, it's not about you. Go on, keep going. Keep so you're putting all your energy into encouraging the people around you, into like cheering them on. That was a lot of fun. It's a great way to get involved in a race when you don't necessarily, you know, want to crush a PB or go full out that day. Julia Cesar, Lim and Jen Wong. Shampoo Tien, Ling Ding, Patrick Wu, Sandro Casper, and Zilin uh, Lai. Yeah, pacing, great trek for that half marathon, but then I also stuck around for the 10K and the 5K, and Ali raced all three of those and I got to watch her race all three of those. I missed her at the finish of the half marathon, which is too bad because she actually won the women's half marathon and that's the first race that she's ever won. She had the lead bike and she had the whole experience of crossing the finish line there. I have a friend who cheered me on during the Vancouver marathon and then decided she wanted to start running and trained for a 5K and I actually got to run that with her, which was a really cool experience. I got to cheer her on for the 10 and the 5 and I just think it's very like 
inspiring to, to see somebody who you know has also put in all of that work and is sort of going through the same things. It's pretty cool to see them, you know, accomplish those goals. And it's just as fun, you know, as, as doing it yourself. It kind of rounds out the, the whole thing for me. Going into the New York City Marathon, my number one goal is just to have fun, to take the whole thing in and be able to like be present and, and look around and enjoy the experience because I don't know like when I'll be back. I've never been to New York. I don't know when I'll go back. So for me, I just want to be able to take it all in, sort of do what I did at my first marathon and just go into it without a lot of expectations and just have a ton of fun. And I guess my sort of 1B goal is going to be to execute my race plan. In an ideal world, I would love to see a number that goes 240 something. But regardless of how fast or slow I go out, I'm going to empty my tank. I know that's who I am. I'm going to give it everything I got. I will suffer, but hopefully not as early. And at the end of the day, I think that's all I can really ask for and hope for and that's what I'm really putting my trust in that I've done all that work and now you know on race day I'm gonna give it 100% whatever happens is gonna happen. It's Marathon Weekend in New York City. 50,000 people getting ready for the big race this Sunday. Sunday morning, runners will face unseasonably warm weather. Warm weather that could break records. And as if the course wasn't hard enough, the runners and wheelchair racers will encounter unseasonably warm weather that may slow the pace. Gun goes off, it's kind of a mass start. I had started out in the front of my corral, but I kind of let some people sneak around me because I didn't think it was that big of a deal. The first kilometer I got absolutely stuck in, couldn't get around people. There's thousands of people going over the bridge. There's like camera crews out there, photographers standing in the middle of the road. It was kind of madness. I was feeling really hot. Just took a little peek at my heart rate and I was going at 191 beats per minute. And I kind of knew at that point I might be in a little bit of trouble. I jogged up to some other people, tried to settle in, thought, you know, I'm just gonna sit on it. I'm gonna ride it out for a little bit. And got back on pace, um, felt okay, going up to around five, six K. I saw my dad for the first time. It was awesome. I was running on the right side of the road. My goal! My goal! And then I ran another, four or five K was feeling all right. But by the time I got to around 10, 11 kilometers in, I knew that today's not gonna be a PB, slow start. It's crazy hot out, not feeling great. Made it to kilometer 12-ish, saw my dad again. Uh, and then after that, it kind of just became a big struggle puddle. I really started to feel it more and more. In training, I felt it before, and in training, I know that I was at the limit at that point, and I didn't want to put my body to the limit at kilometer 15. I didn't switch off my watch, but I changed the screen. I flipped it down, stopped looking at it. Today is not the day for time. Today is just a day to run as hard as I can, uh, to take it all in, and to just you know enjoy the New York City Marathon. And that was sort of my goal for the rest of the race. I knew I wasn't going under three hours, hitting the halfway point at 132 and 
knowing that to get under that I would need to speed up. I knew I wasn't speeding up. 21 to 25, starting to slow down a little bit. Oh man, I wonder what my girlfriend is thinking back home, looking at her phone, wondering what's going on. It's okay, there's nothing we can do about that. I'm gonna enjoy this, I'm gonna rock and roll, I'm gonna get over this bridge, we're gonna do the back half of the marathon. About two hours into the race, just said to myself, okay, I need to finish this. I was pounding back water. All I wanted to do was survive. Around kilometer 30, 31, pulled up alongside my training partner. He was walking, he had just been to the medic tent. It's not just me, like I made the right move to pull back, keep being smart. And as I progressed into the very end of the race, kilometers 35, 36, I came up to some other people, started chatting with them. A lot of people had big goals of going 250, sub three, 245, and we were sort of all in the same boat together. So in a way that was comforting. Ran with a lot of those people back into Manhattan and then got to the personal hell that is Central Park. I've heard a lot about the bridges in New York City. I understand the bridges, you go up, you come down. There's a hill there. Uh, people told me Central Park is a great finish line. They said it's not easy, but you know, I don't think anybody properly described it to me or any of my friends that went what Central Park is like. Uh, it's amazing because you're in one of the most iconic spots in the entire world. I've never been to Central Park. It's absolutely amazing. It's huge. It's this beautiful, green, like, luscious park in the middle of this huge city, but it's also just built on a hill. You run up one side of Central Park and you're just running up a hill for like three straight kilometers and people are just dying. Like left and right, people are cramping, people are walking. It was some of the worst I've seen in any race. But after I came up that hill where I ran real slow, uh, you run into the park and it's super exciting because like you're in the heart of Central Park and you feel so close. And then you come to that last kilometer you're rolling up and down these hills that never stop, just up and down, up and down. There's a sign, gives you 800 meters, where you're like, okay, hey, I'm close, but I'm not quite there. I just want to survive. Started running a little bit faster at that point. Wanted to make sure that, you know, even on a tough day, I, I emptied the tank and I saw the sign for 400 meters and that's one lap of a track. I knew I can run that. So I was running as hard as I could and the last like 300 meters in New York City Marathon are also just up, straight up a goddamn hill in the middle of Central Park. So I ran up that hill. I knew my dad was gonna be at the finish line there. Three hours, 19 minutes and change. Got my medal and then I was trying to get a seat, was trying to just, you know, deal with my, my sniffling, my tears, my cramping my legs and everything like that. I was lucky enough to meet up with another one of my friends who had gone, he kind of saved me. I collapsed into his arms in my cute little Roadrunner's poncho and then ended up walking with him. It took us about 25 minutes to get out of there. Found my dad standing there in his neon jacket by the letter S and then we caught the most expensive commute back to the hotel on one of those little rickshaw bike guys who pulls you in a carriage. All done. Um, took that back to the hotel and that was sort of the end of my race experience. I think even though the time wasn't something that you know, I had hoped for or think was an accurate reflection of how hard I trained, I think a lot of stuff still went really well. I'm also really happy and just feel lucky that for the second marathon that I've done in a row, my diabetes has been almost perfect. No highs, no lows. You know, for me that's super exciting to see and that just feels really nice that some of those things on a really tough day still went really well for me. I think when I first started getting into running and the marathon, I always thought, you know, would I stick around if I wasn't running fast? Would it be enjoyable if I wasn't running fast? What would happen if I went out and trained for a marathon and it didn't go as I'd planned? 
I didn't run very fast at all. It all went to shits. What would I do? Would I be able to handle that? Would I still love it? And you know, after this marathon, I think I think I learned a lot. I learned that you can still have a great time at a marathon, and for it to still be an amazing experience by not running fast. That there's a lot of other things you can take from a marathon. That you know, if it goes wrong, it's not as scary as it seems. It doesn't mean that you're not fit. It doesn't mean that you did all that training for nothing. It doesn't mean you can't have a great time out there. And you know, I had a great time out there. Uh, I got to share it with a lot of amazing people. I got to share it with my girlfriend who was back home watching. I got to share the whole race and weekend with my dad who came out to cheer and saw me run for the first time. Got to share it with the guy behind the camera right now and all the people back home at my run crew. <laughs> Running means a lot in my life. It's given me so many friendships. It's really brought me all the people I love the most, the community I love the most. There's so much more to running than running fast. And I think, unfortunately, you know, you can't run a PB, you can't run fast every time. But that's when you learn, you know, why do you run? Are you out here to run fast? Of course, but I also run because it makes me feel really proud of myself. It lets me see different places in the world. It lets me you know, bond and share these experiences with my dad, with my friends. So at the end of the day, it wasn't my fastest race, but still one of the coolest things I've done and I'm ready to come back for more. <laughs> Done? <laughs> oh my gosh, I don't know. Tongue tied. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Good work! Hey! That was really good. That was fun. New York Sui. Oh. <laughs> you want to say New York Sui? <laughs> <laughs> It's a, it's a wrap, but do you have anything else? Okay, I think one more. <laughs> okay, got that on camera. <laughs> Insane! <laughs> <laughs>